famous last words. You know, the fact is that when, when people die, or right before they die, you expect them to talk with their families and say something uh, very profound, very deep, very meaningful. And sometimes that's the case, and sometimes uh, that's not. I was in a conversation with some people uh, last night over at the Warmoth's house, and I was told, I didn't know this, that it was actually a minister from the Church of Christ that preached Elvis, Elvis Presley's funeral down there in uh, Memphis. But anyway, on the night that Elvis died, uh, everything was just going along, and uh, Elvis said, oh, I'm going to the bathroom to read. And that's it. That was his last word. Not even a thank you very much. Just I'm going to the bathroom to read. You never know how death will take you. Frank Sinatra, the great crooner. You know, the great singer that influenced music so much. Right before he died, he said, I'm losing it. And he died. And how profound is, is that? Marie Antoinette who was about to be executed by the executioner. Uh, on her way up to the guillotine, she stepped on the executioner's foot. And she said, pardonnez-moi, monsieur, or excuse me, sir. That was her last words. Harriet Tubman, who was dying in 1913, this great matriarch of the slave community in her day who had done so much for this country, her last words were a bit more profound. She said, swing low, sweet chariot. And then there was convicted murderer Thomas J. Grasso on uh, death row. And he was about to be executed on death row. And he said, I did not get my SpaghettiOs. I got spaghetti. And I want the press to know it. That's it. Right after that. Do our last words say something about our nature? You know, maybe they do. Abraham Lincoln was in Ford Theater, you know, and he was watching a play, and he'd been through a terrible time of life and the Civil War and everything, and he had a night out with his wife. And he was kind of a tender-hearted guy, and he reached over. Yeah, they were up in the presidential kind of thing and down there in the theater, and he reached over and took Mary Lincoln's hand. And she was a little nervous about PDA, you know, public dis uh, displays of affection. He took his wife's hand. He wanted to hold her hand. And she said, Abraham, everybody will see. And he said, it doesn't matter. Boom, bullet. And that was the last words he said. It doesn't matter. I don't care if everyone sees. I want to hold my wife's hand. Sir Winston Churchill, you know who took us through World War II, and he said, never, 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 never. You know, that guy. He said, I'm bored with it all. And there he went. Famous surgeon Joseph Henry Green was checking his own pulse. He was interested in the medical nature of it. He was checking his own pulse as he lay dying, counting the beats per minute. And all of a sudden, he said, it stopped. Okay. And then actress, actress Joan Crawford was laying dying in her home, and her housekeeper was over there just praying, praying, praying to the Lord for Joan, and she snapped over to her housekeeper, don't you dare ask God to help me, and then... Wouldn't you hate to go out on that particular note? Famous last words. You know, the fact is that life is uncertain and death is uncertain. And many of us will be just going about our normal walk of life, doing things we normally do. And we'll just go. And it's no telling what our last words will be. But the last words of Jesus Christ recorded for us in the, in the four Gospels are indeed very profound, and I want to share those with you today as we move toward this unity meal, the Lord's Supper. In John 19, verse 28, and if you have your little outline, you can fill in. Jesus was up on the cross. He'd been beaten. He'd been tortured. He'd been hung there, and, and his boss body was exhausted, and he said, I'm thirsty. You know, those words are very simple. I'm thirsty. 
But the Bible says in the Gospel of John, the Word became flesh and lived for a while among us. And he really did become flesh. He was a man. He was a human being. John 4, verse 7, it was noon and Jesus was traveling. And he came to a well in Samaria. And the Bible says he was tired and he sat down and out came a woman. And he said, woman, could you please give me something to drink? He got hot like we do. He was weary, sometimes bone weary. He was hungry. He was thirsty like we are. He was lonely like many of us are so often. He was pained. He, he suffered pain. He was sick just like you and me. He got cold. He was scared. He was often very much afraid. The Bible says he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Every single thing that we go through as human beings, he went through. Being one who suffered when he was tempted, Hebrews 2.18, he's able to help others of us who are tempted. He was a human being. I want you to know that God became flesh. He had to become flesh to be our perfect sacrifice. He lived as a man. He lived with all our weaknesses. He showed us how to obey God. And to the very end, he was 100% a human being who did it like we have to do it. In John 19, 35, when he died, the soldier pierced his side and out came blood and water. He bled just like you and I do. I am thirsty, said Jesus. And so in, the, in those little words, I'm thirsty, the human experience is captured. Jesus was a human being. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, himself a man, Jesus Christ. Next, in Luke 23, verse 34, Jesus looked down upon those rabid Jewish leaders who had been saying, crucify him, crucify him, and the people that were shouting for his blood. And he looked down upon those hardened Roman soldiers who had the details of cru crucifixion, who had laid him on the cross and who had beaten him and had nailed him and who had raised him up and dropped it in the hole and were, were overseeing his execution. And he looked down upon them all and said something absolutely remarkable. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, when Jesus was teaching the Sermon on the Mount, remember in Matthew 6, verse 12, he taught us to pray. And everybody in this church needs to really listen to these words. He taught us to pray, forgive us our debts, finish it for me, as we forgive our debtors, Matthew 6, 12. And then two verses later in verse 14, he says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, even so will your Father in heaven forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive forgive you hear those words my brothers and sister from the man who looked down from the cross on his executioners and said father forgive them for they know not what they do his mission was redemption his mission was forgiveness he was offended grievously but loved anyway and wanted to forgive never forget that our God wants to accept he wants to forgive Romans 8, 32 and 33, if God is for us, and he is, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but freely delivered him up for all of us, shall he not also along with him freely give us everything? Jesus understood the ignorance of the people that were killing him. He understood their fear. He understood the forces that were compelling those Jews to be as they were. He understood those things that, that compelled those Roman soldiers. He understood that the very people that were killing him were misguided human beings that God loved just like he loved everyone else. And that's why he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Isn't it wonderful how much Jesus wants to forgive us? I suggest that we be the same way as Jesus is. In Luke 23, verse 43, Jesus said, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. There were two criminals hanging on either side 
of Jesus. Oh, yes, they were criminals. They had done some very, very bad things. One was very angry. He was angry to be there. He was angry at the world. He was angry at life. There are many people in our country. There are many people even maybe in our church fellowship who at times are angry. We all get angry, don't we? There was one thief that was angry and he was letting his anger spill out. There was another humble thief who accepted himself and who he was and he accepted what he had done. And the angry one was being very unjust to Jesus and he intervened and said, don't you even fear God? Seeing that we are receiving the just rewards of our deeds. In other words, we're getting just what we deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. This man realized that he was punished justly. Let me ask you a question. How many of us have gotten away with crimes for which we've never been caught? How many of us who have done things in our lives and were just plain lucky how many of us have done things, all of us, that have offended God and have offended man? And how would it be if all of us got just what we deserve? But this man was humble and this man was penitent. And Jesus already knew that everyone on earth deserves condemnation. For the wages of sin is death, right? All have sinned and do fall short of the glory of God. And Jesus, the sinless one, knew that. And so Jesus was looking for humble, penitent souls. And do you know that all of his life, from the day that he went out and began his ministry, he never stopped looking for souls, one soul after another, a litany of people that he encountered, every one of them sinful, every one of them lost. And even while he was being beaten and crucified, he was looking to his right and left and looking for humble, penitent souls. What pleasure it must have given him to look into that man's heart and to say, today you will be with me in paradise. Wouldn't it be great if the last thing you and I could be responsible for in this world is the winning of a soul? Wouldn't that be great? Jesus, thank you for your example. In Matthew 27, verse 46, Jesus cried out in sadness and loneliness, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For some reason, these words have been made so poignant by the fact that when the gospel writers wrote in Greek in the New Testament, they bothered to put these particular words in the native Aramaic or Hebrew that Jesus spoke. Eli, Eli, lama sabata'ani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, in this moment, was sad. Jesus, in this moment, was so lonely. He was the loneliest he'd ever been. Jesus felt forsaken. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about what brought that on. Jesus was very, very close to his father. As Jesus walked through life and he had his disappointments and his ups and downs and his discouragements, he stayed close to his father. He talked to his father all the time. Jordan, he kept in touch with God's word and he kept in touch in prayer. And he was always talking to God and God was always there for him. And sometimes the angels came and ministered to him like in the Garden of Gethsemane. So always he had the father just to reach out and touch with his soul. One night, Jesus had been praying, and he prayed all night, and he did this, I'm sure, regularly. And somebody, one of his disciples, marveled at his prayer life and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Luke 11, verse 1. We sing a song that says, you, O Lord, are my refuge. But that was really true for Jesus in every moment of his life. He was the one Jesus always turned to. The old song says, my God and I... Go in the fields together. We walk and talk as good friends should and do. The Bible says of Moses, he spoke to the Lord face to face as a man speaks to his friend. This is the way Jesus was to the max. So when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, notice he didn't say 
just God. He said, my God. And every one of us ought to have that kind of a relationship. My God, a personal relationship. But Jesus was actually quoting scripture when he said that. Did you know that? He was quoting from Psalm 22, 1. This psalm in Psalm 22 was an expression of David's absolute loneliness and discouragement and desperation. I think when Absalom took over his kingdom and he was run out of town and all that, I think that's when David wrote this. And David wrote these words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? Why are you so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer by night, and I am not silent. And we could go on. Jesus could quote that psalm. Don't you think he couldn't? And Jesus understood every word of every emotion in that psalm. And in this moment when the skies turned black, and as one of our songs says, the Father turned his face away because Jesus bore my sin and yours on his back. And Jesus was bearing not only the physical pain, but the emotional pain of abandonment and separation for you and for me. He knew that in all of his world, that one psalm captured the loneliness and depth of desperation that he was feeling right then. And that's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We sing an old song that says, he died alone for you and me. That's amazing, amazing love. In John 19, 26, Jesus was concerned about his family. Jesus saw his mother standing down at the foot of the cross, and there was only one, count them, one of his disciples left. Out of that 12, Judas had betrayed him, and the rest of them had run away. But there was one, not much more than a teenager, down there with his mother. He's called the disciple whom Jesus loved. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Family was important to Jesus. Family is important to God. When God made the world... In Genesis 2, in the very beginning of the Bible, folks, we are told about the creation of family, where a woman was given to a man, and therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cling to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Family, one of the basic tenets of God's Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, is about family. Honor your father and your mother, said Paul which is the first commandment with a promise. If you go back to Exodus 20, there's a promise with it. You do this, you honor your father and your mother, and you respect family so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. That was so important to God. Jesus spoke in Matthew 15 and Mark 7 about honoring your father and your mother. And there are many of you right now in this congregation who are laboring diligently to take care of your aged parents and you're doing the best you can like Brandon Morgan and others to do right by your mother and your father because Jesus said so and it's the right thing to do. So when Jesus looked down, he knew that that was his responsibility to God and he said, woman, this is your son. This is your mother. You know, John was a young man. Can you imagine giving responsibility of your mother to a wet-behind-the-ears teenager? But John 7, verse 5, Jesus' brothers did not believe on him. And he wanted his mother in the care of a dedicated disciple who never left him when he went to be arrested, who was there at the high priest when Peter denied him three times, who was the only one left standing at the foot of the cross, who would be one of the great disciples that would live into the second century and lead his people. He wanted that one to be in the care of his mother. His physical family was important, but the spiritual welfare of his mother was the most important thing in the world. What an example, Jesus. Thank you for those words. In John 19, verse 30, 
Jesus uttered three very powerful and dynamic words. It is finished. You know, Hebrews 10 and verse 5. When the firstborn came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you did not desire. Withhold burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins you took no pleasure. Then said I, I have come to do your will, O God. Jesus had to come to die as a sacrifice for sin. He had to have a human body. He had to live a perfect life. He had to experience everything we do so that he could die as a sacrifice for our sins. As he was going through the gospel several times in Matthew and Mark, he said to his disciples who didn't know what he was talking about, he said, listen, the Son of Man must suffer many things. And he must be rejected by the chief priests, scribes, and elders. And he must be crucified and he will rise again. And Peter said, no, 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 no. That'll never happen to you. No. And Jesus insisted that he must go to Jerusalem. Every road in Jesus' life led to Jerusalem. Every road led to uh, Pilate's house. Every road led to the condemnation of the high priest. Every road led to that cross. And he knew it. He knew it when he begged God, please don't let me have to suffer this. And God said, it's not what you want, Jesus. It's what I want. You're going to have to do what I ask you to do. His young man, disciple, who was an old man by the time he wrote 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Old Apostle John, long remembering Jesus at the cross. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is a satisfaction offering for our sins. And not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. The Son of Man did what had to be done. And when he'd done it, when he had done the will of the Father, when he'd sacrificed himself for you and for me, thank God, he could breathe his last and say, Ah, oh, it's finished. I've done what God sent me to do. All we like sheep have gone astray, wrote the prophet. We have turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the sin of us all. In Luke 23, verse 46, right before Jesus' spirit left his body, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Church, do you believe that when a person dies, the body returns to the dust and the spirit returns to God who gave it? Do you believe that? Doesn't the Bible teach that? And the King James Bible, when Jesus died, says that Jesus gave up the ghost. The word there is P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma, which means he gave up his spirit. So at the very moment when a person dies, the eternal soul or spirit of a person leaves the body and goes to face its maker, goes to God. Jesus had no qualms about that. Jesus knew that he had put his hand in God's hand. Jesus was trusting his father. Jesus knew where he was going. We sing an old song that's really about death. When my Savior calls, I will answer. When my Savior calls, I will hear. When my Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name when you die and you don't know when that'll be it could be today it could be tomorrow it could be 20 years from now or 30 or 50 will you be able to say with such love and confidence not trusting in yourself at all but trusting in God and your relationship with him father into your hands I commend my spirit is that not the point of life? 
Didn't the Bible say that to fear God and keep his commandments was the whole duty of man? Didn't Paul say in Acts that we were created to seek God and find him? And that's where we find our very purpose of being. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. Folks, today we're going to come together at the foot of the cross and we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We're going to gather in unity. We're going to gather in forgiveness of each other. We're going to gather in love for one another. We're going to gather in rededication of our lives to Jesus. And we're going to think about these things from the cross. Now, there there are two things that might happen. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, and you're not yet ready to partake of the Lord's Supper then we're hoping that we can form a relationship with you and sit down and really share the technical, uh, the what, what to do in the gospel, and that you can obey the gospel, and you can join us in this sacred feast. But if you're a Christian, I hope that you will gather together today with your whole heart. Jed's going to come lead us in a couple of songs that are really going to help us to uh, prepare for this moment. So, Brother Jed, come on down. And I'd like you to stand together and let's sing together as we prepare our hearts.